Well, good evening to you all, and welcome to this uh, watch night service for 2020 through into 2021. Uh, we are again uh, having to abide by the uh, various restrictions there are in uh, what we're able to do, and uh, we trust, though, nonetheless, that the Lord will be with us as He always is, and He's shown His grace and mercy and support in all that we've been seeking to do, and we look to him uh, to help us as we uh, come together uh, in this way uh, this evening. I want to read just a verse from Exodus in chapter 15, uh, and that verse is Exodus 15 and verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. Let's pray. Father, as we come at the end of another year, we thank you, Lord, for your providential guidance, for your blessings, for the strength that you have given. And Lord, as we come together now to give thanks in our various homes, wherever we might be, we pray, Lord God, that you would meet with us and help us and aid us as we seek so to do. Lord, do bless us mightily, we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to read now from the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 40. been looking at this a couple of times just recently. I want to read from verse 18 through to verse 26. Isaiah 40 and verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare him with? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and casts it for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He, seek out, he seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Will you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and his inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing, who makes the rulers of this earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see, who created these? He brings them out by their host, by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Amen. And we pray that God would be pleased to bless his word to us as we come to consider that in a few moments. But before we do so, let's again Come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Merciful God and Father, we do thank and praise you for this opportunity to meet together and to encourage one another as we do reflect upon all that you have given to us over this past year and look to you for all the blessings that should be ours in the year that is to come. We do have to, Lord, confess that this year has been a very difficult one, something that we have not experienced before. And, Lord, we know that many have suffered. There have been many bereavements. Over 60,000 have died as a result of the coronavirus. And, Lord, we are troubled. And, Lord, we do reflect on this, yet... Lord, we know, for you have assured us 
that you are with us in this, for Lord, you are a great and a glorious and almighty God. For Lord, you are the true God. You are the one who is always in control. The one Lord who always watches over your people. The one Lord who always blesses. And even in the most difficult of times, the most trying of circumstances, we know, Lord, that you are there, that your presence surrounds us, your presence lifts us up, your presence, Lord, gives us that sure knowledge that the one that we worship, the one that we know, is the true and the living, the almighty God. Oh, Lord, we do praise you for this. And Lord, we pray that as we reflect on these things and look forward to others, that we might, ever, we might never lose sight of who you are, of all that you have done, that you are God, that you are in the heavens and you watch over us on this earth. Do you remember, Lord, those many families that have suffered bereavement as a result of the coronavirus? We pray, Lord God, that you will reach out to them. Lord, we ourselves have known some very close personal friends who have been called to stand before you. Lord, we do thank you for their lives and we pray for their families at this time. Be with them, encourage them, help them, we pray. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon us as a church. Lord, even though for many months we've not been able to meet as we would normally seek so to do. Yet, Lord, you have never left us. We've always met with you. We've always been aware of your grace, of your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the glorious opportunity given to us that we can meet in our own homes and listen to your word and worship to you together. But, Lord, our great heartfelt desire is that the time might come soon when we can meet together in a normal way, where we can share together, where we can greet each other in the right way. And Lord, we do pray that you would so work in all that has been done that this might be our experience soon in 2021. Do thank you, Lord, for the viruses, uh, for the... Uh, <laughs> the <clears throat> vaccinations that are available to deal with these viruses and we praise you Lord God that you would use them the Lord as they many are inoculated they may be given the strength that they need and the Lord this may soon come to an end we praise you Lord for the gifts that you have given to those who are able to develop these vaccines and use them in this way we continue, Lord, to see to support and uphold our government. As, as a nation, we enter into a political regime that is so different from what it has been over the last 40 or so years. We pray, Lord God, that you will guide us and direct us, that, Lord, you will manifest your grace. Lord, as we consider our history, we know that on many times you have come upon our land and you have blessed in mighty ways with sending your spirit in reviving power. Oh, Lord, our desire is that this again may be so, that you would so work, you would show, so show yourself, that, Lord, you would revive your church, revive us, and, Lord, we pray, do enable us, do help us. Lord, may we truly be able to bear witness to your great love and your great mercy. Hear us then, we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, can we turn together now to that passage I read from Isaiah chapter 40 uh, as we do consider uh, those words. We have been looking, as I said, at this uh, passage uh, over the last couple of sessions where I have been preaching and we have noted that uh, this chapter is one in which the Lord is speaking to his people and is particularly and especially bringing words of comfort when they were in a very difficult, a very trying situation. They had been exiled from their land of Israel. 
They had left the temple in ruins and the city of Jerusalem in ruins and they were in Babylon, a foreign land, and they were so despondent, they were so distressed, and there were so many problems with which they had to deal with. But the Lord had not forgotten them. The Lord had promised he would come to them. And exactly as he recorded in the prophet Jeremiah, 70 years after their exile, he did come and he blessed. And these words in the prophecy of Isaiah were used towards that blessing, to help in that blessing, to show the great glory of God's grace and the amazing might of your power. Lord, how glorious this is that your work, your word, should be seen in this way. And we do thank you, Lord God, that that is truly so, that you have acted in a mighty and a powerful way, that you have shown forth, Lord, all that you are able to do. And Lord, we know that in these things we see the glorious working of your grace. And there are three particular things that I want us to note about God as we look at these things together uh, this evening. And the first is concerning the likeness of God. That he is unique in verses 19 to 21. We pray, Lord, that you would show us more of yourself in this, that you would act, Lord, in a mighty, a glorious, a powerful way, that your grace, Lord, will be shown, that your might will be demonstrated. In those verses we read that you are the God, he says in verse 20, 19 and 20, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? <coughs> a craftsman, uh, compare with him an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for, <coughs> for its silver chain. He who is too impoverished to, for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. He sees this. He works in a glorious way. He works in a mighty way and a powerful way. And it is so utterly foolish for any to seek to make any likeness of God. Because he is God. And this is what so many people sought to do, of course. They sought to make these likenesses that they might say that these are our gods. Remember the time when the Israelites were undertaking their journey out of Egypt. And very early on, they made that golden calf and worshipped that golden calf as the God who had redeemed them. But it's impossible. To what, says the Lord, you shall liken me. It, it, it is foolish. And they would make these idols of gold, or if they were too poor, they would make these idols of wood. And they have it overlaid perhaps with gold or with other precious metals, and they would worship those wooden idols that can't move, that can't speak, that can't act, can't hear, can't see, can't speak. They would use those as their gods. And this is what we have seen, I would suggest, in many different situations throughout our nation over these last few months particularly. That people, they're not making actual idols as we understand them normally to be, but they are making their own gods. The world has always done this. They seek to uh, reject God, but they, there is that innate desire and need in them that they must have some sort of God. And so they make gods of their own philosophies, their own ideas, their own suppositions. And it is a God that has nothing to do with the true God who has revealed us, himself to us in his word. For he alone is is God. No matter how wonderful, no matter how fine, how creative the craftsman may be, no matter how uh, powerful the arguments of those who make their own gods may seem to be, no matter how they must seem to rest on such uh, uh, clear evidence and fact, they are false. For they are not God. Sadly, we find those who profess to be Christians 
who also make their own gods. They, uh, they make gods according to their image rather than acknowledge that God has made them in accord with his image. Uh, and they have certain views of God. They have, say certain things about God. You find some say, well, you know, I can't accept the God of the Old Testament that uh, had wars and people killed and all those sort of things. That's not the God I like. That's not the God I know. I just want the God of love. And it's a, a nonsense. And they reject who God is indeed. By so doing, they actually reject the love of God in that. There are those who say that uh, uh, the, way, the way they worship, that, uh, uh, that they must do it in a certain way that is not in accord with what the Scriptures actually teach us. And they make up their own God. And whatever is important to us, whatever it might be in our attitude, our action, in things that we love to do, places we like to go, ideas that we have to have, if they don't truly come from a knowledge of the true God, they are false gods. And we should not worship them. They're pointless. They're not going to get us anywhere. For they are not God. And so we must always remember that our God is totally unique. There is nothing, no one, no idea, no philosophy that is anything like our God. For it is not a God that we have invented. It's not a God that we have made up. It's not a God that we have formed. It is God who is the almighty God who has revealed himself. Which brings us to the second thing that we see here in these two verses, in verses 21 to 24. That God is truly divine. In verse 21 we read, Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and his inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. He who brings princes to nothing, and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows on them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. He is saying, look, face the facts. Face the real situation. Look at what you see. And what does that proclaim? The whole of creation. It proclaims that there is a God. And it is the true God. Now, many reject that, of course. Many dismiss that. They see that as total nonsense. But that makes not an out of difference to the fact that it is truly showing forth the glory and the wonder of our God. And in comparison, the inhabitants of the earth, the inhabitants of all that God has created, are as nothing. He blows on them. They have no root. They have no strength. They have no real ability. And they're just carried away like the stubble in the wind. All those in power, all those in authority, all those who have such wonderful ideas about who they think God is. It is all as nothing. There is no point. There is no substance. There is no reality in that God. There is no divinity. There is no Godhead. There is no omniscience. There is no omnipotence. There is no omnipresence. For it is only God who has these characteristics. It is only God of whom those things can be said. It is only God who truly is the one true and absolutely holy God. So think on that. As we perhaps have questioned things, as we have been worried, and there are so many things, particularly as we mentioned with the coronavirus and the problems that that has brought, immense, we would never have imagined them. And then there is this whole political change with Brexit, whatever our views might be, it's one of the most major changes in our history. But God is there. God is working things out. 
And the truth is that this God who has created us, this God who in his grace has redeemed us, this God has never left us. He's always there. And all these things are in his hand. Which means the third main thing that we see in these verses, that our God is absolutely sovereign. He is the true sovereign, the true ruler, the one who is always in control. Verse 25 we read, To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He, he who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. He is the sovereign and the all-glorious God. And who to whom can we truly compare him? There is no comparison. For there is nothing, there is no one who is like God. And again, you've only got to lift up your eyes. You say, lift up your eyes into the sky, see the stars, the uh, countless host that is there, and see the glory of God. And all these things are in his hand. All these things are in his control. You know, so many people have been saying, I've had conversations today with people who said, well, what's going to happen? When is it all going to end? What is this going to lead to? When will it all become right? Well, I don't know. I don't have the answers to that question. But God does. And God will bring it to an end. And God will glorify himself in that. Many times today I've heard again, as we've heard uh, perhaps countless times, that uh, we're in a tunnel, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And they've been talking uh, about the, the vaccines and that the, the light is there at the end of the tunnel. And I've said, I repeat, yes, we may feel that we are in a tunnel, but the light is not at the end of the tunnel. The light is with us. For God, our Creator, God, our Sovereign Lord, is ever with us in the darkest, in the depths of despair, in the bleakest and most painful and most hard situations and circumstances to bear. He is there. And we may not be able to discern at this time, we may not even discern in the years to come, why it is that God allowed us to go through those experiences. But I believe we will in glory. The hymnist sums it up so well when it says, with mercy and with judgment, <coughs> he exercised, he worked all these things. And even the Jews of sorrow were lusted by his love. I bless the hand that guided. I bless the heart that planned when throned where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. He will be with us, but we pray that we will made clear that blessing will come upon us now. History shows that at times when there have been such powerful epidemics, when many, many have died, so often it's been followed by glorious blessing from the hand of God. These things that we see, they're not due to normal, natural events, the stars that appear, the planets, and all that we see around us. They are a manifestation of the great glory of God, the great wonder of God, the great mercy of God. And we do glory in all that he has given and rejoice in that. In Psalm 151, the psalmist opens that psalm by saying, 
not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. And as we enter a new year, not knowing, of course, what that year will bring, except that it will be that God will always be with us as we enter that year. I want to wish you all a truly happy and a blessed new year but remind you of where that true happiness and blessedness is found. In the first psalm, we read these words in the first two verses. Blessed or happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That is true happiness. That's the way of true blessing, that we delight in the law of God, his word. And we live in accord with that. That that word directs and governs every step of our way. Well, may that be the case. Whatever may come, whatever may be the difficulties, may we truly follow his word. And by his grace, might he please us in this new year to know him to know his blessing, to know that blessing being showered upon us day after day. And may we grow closer to him and know him in a deeper way. May the Lord bless each one of us. Let's pray. Gracious God and Father, we do thank you that we can now look forward to a new year. We do not know what's going to happen. But Lord, we know we look forward to, forward to it with you. That you who are alone, God, you who are absolutely divine, you who are the true sovereign over all things, enable us, Lord, may we see you Go before us, go with us. Bless us mightily, we pray. Amen.